What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Today, we got a long one for you, hopefully uh, jam-packed with a bunch of information that you'll find useful. I think it's useful, but hey, who knows what I think. It's what all 29 teams in MLS need in the summer transfer window, which officially opens on July 18th. What I want to point out before I get into team-by-team -team breakdown is kind of the difficulty facing some sporting directors and some teams with that later start date for the transfer window. And first of all, last year it was a little bit earlier, and this year it made it a little bit later, and it's kind of difficult because it's in that in-between phase. Last year, it opened the beginning of July, so then it closed in the beginning of August. The reason this happens is because the secondary, the in-season transfer window, according to FIFA, can only be open for four weeks. So they can't extend it longer if they want. They could just move it up or move it back. Last year, when the, the window was closing at early August, there were, there were teams that were trying to do deals, and there were some players who had interest in Europe, and they thought, hey, if we just stay at our club a deal is going to come for somewhere else in Europe before the, the European deadline at the end of August. So the league tried to move it back because of those concerns. So that's why it opens later. Now with it opening later, there's only really like a third of the season, a quarter of the season left for these teams. So if you're really good, that's great because then you're just adding like LAFC adding Olivier Giroud. That's probably going to be pretty easy. But if you're, I don't know, Orlando, Chicago, New England, some of these teams that are further down and, and wanting to kick on as the season goes on, are you going to pull up assets from the future? Because what happens if you sign somebody today, they can't even debut until mid-July. And even at that, there's one game before the league's cup break. And then all of a sudden there's eight games left and you're eight points below the playoff line. And it's like, well, we just mortgaged some of our future to try to save this season, but the season's ended already, right? Or, or, or we're, we're too far gone. So that's something that I've been talking to sporting directors that, that they find difficult. The trade market is something that is a little bit slow right now, in part because of, of all of this and because it does the, the window doesn't open for another few weeks. So if you do a trade right now, like the AZ Jackson trade to Columbus, now you just can't play for St. Louis or Columbus for the next you know better part of a month from when that trade was agreed. So these are a lot of moving parts that I thought was important to kind of bring out into this discussion, just to keep in your mind. But the meat and potatoes of, of, this, of this video is going to be going team by team, what every single team needs in the summer transfer window. I'm going to give you a little bit of, you know, a lot of, reporting here like this is these are come from a lot of conversations i've had with a lot of people and also just looking at realistic right like every team would love to have a dp number every team would love to have an olivier Giroud coming this summer but some teams don't have dp spots or some teams don't have the money so whatever right like so this is going to be as realistic as it gets from the conversations i've had with that as a too long of a preamble let's go what's up Let's start with one of the most interesting teams to watch this summer full stop i uh, might as well be number one honestly atlanta united they're starting with a head coaching search they need to replace Yorgos Yakamakis with the DP number nine. They are looking to sort an Tiago Almada deal with all the rumors that we'll get into very soon. And then when he leaves, replace him with the DP number 10. Above all, they just need elite chance creation and elite goal scoring. Um, that's pretty obvious in how this is working out for this team in DP number nine is your goal scorer, DP number 10 is your chance creator. Um, it might just be that simple. Um, we'll start with the head coach. I wonder what direction that they're going to go in, whether it's going to be MLS experience or a bigger name. They've tried bunch of different ways since Tata. Nothing has really stuck. You know, Frank DeBoer, Gabriel Heinze, Gonzalo Pineda. Those are all three different profiles, extremely different profiles. Hasn't quite worked out. Garth Lagerwey at the helm. That's somebody that, again, I trust in with all of this. So it goes with the head coach. They're probably going to want to play up-tempo, attractive soccer. Everybody wants to play like that. But again, Atlanta United, they have their standards and they have their expectations from a wonderful fan base. So that's what I'm expecting from the head coach. Don't know what the timeline is there. Um, the good news is if you get the right DP9, DP10, like Yorgos Yakumakis, didn't really matter who the head coach was and what the system was. That was a good signing. So you try to replicate that again here. So we'll start with that. I assume that whether, again, what somebody who can play with Almada is somebody who is, you know, not quite like, like if you have Tiago Almada, you don't need a, a Cucho Hernandez type. You don't need somebody who's going to get on the ball and have a really high usage rate. You need somebody, say like Yorgos Yakumakis, that's a pure goal scorer, Works hard against the ball, makes smart runs, um, and wins fouls as well. Again, particularly for somebody with Thiago Amada's set piece skill set. So that's what I would be looking for as a DP9. You already have players that can play in transition on the wings and Saba Lobijanice and John De Silva. And then again, you, you try to just get the orchestrator as your number 10. And again, if they can get it, it's like Thiago Amada has been an MVP candidate. Yori Giacomakis had a really good goal rate. If they can just replicate that, then they'll be, they'll be good. I'm assuming that both of these players will be in prime. That's what Garth Lagerwey has always said. That's what he wants. That's what he likes. That's how he believes to build winning culture. Um, as for Thiago Mata, talked about it on the previous video. There are these links and, and reports and, and real talk and, and owners giving YouTube video um, 
interviews or just recording their own. I don't know what that John Sexton interview was. He said that they hadn't yet uh, given Atlanta their offer, but he was going to today at time of recording. So uh, you'd assume that that's already come in. This story is just bizarre. There's been a lot of either false reporting or people saying that there's false reporting. I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen? Tiago Amada, like the Olympics is coming up, so they could sell him around then. I think that this is really going to be the end for Tiago Amada, Atlanta. Move forward. So no more will he, won't he. There's, you know, the contract expiring when it does, I believe, the end of uh, 25. So, you know, this is kind of when they have to do with the deal. We'll see what happens. You know, again, there's a lot of moving parts here. And this is one of the most interesting teams to watch. One more, just to keep an eye on, just, just a little bit. Caleb Wiley. The summer might be time. He's also going to the Olympics. Again, I've said this before. There are a lot of teams that are interested in him. There have already been bids rejected in, in previous windows. I don't know if anything's coming yet this summer. But he's a known commodity in Europe. And right now might be the time. He's got a lot of games under his belt for Atlanta. He's developed really well. It's been win-win for both player and club. It's been awesome. He's watched what happened to George Bello, who just kind of really took pushed and pushed for that Armenia Bielfeld move. Didn't work out. And now he's trying to rebuild his career in Austria. So Caleb Wiley doesn't want that to happen. He wants to get to the right place. But this summer really might be the time. So keep an eye on that. You know, they, they are working on a deal for a left back. And I think that those two things are, are connected. We'll see. Who knows? Next up, Austin FC. This is a team that's already done a lot of work. Usman Bukhari on a DP deal. Club record winger from Red Star Belgrade. Mikel Dessler in at right back. And Alexander Svatok in at center back. Those are three starting caliber players, one of which is supposed to be high, high level as a DP. I really love how quickly that they've done it here. I really like, again, I was critical of them for maybe being a little bit slow on this rebuild and, and really putting their, uh, Rodolfo Burrell putting a stamp on the roster. But I do quite like how they've been methodical. And, and like, again, Bukhari's profile, whether he works out or not, the profile seems to match what you want around Sebastian Driussi. This is a guy who's going to be dynamic vertical, so he's going to give space underneath for Driussi to just feast in. And if he can add goals, then he's going to be a really good signing. So they got him in. He'll be ready to debut. I, I believe that he just got into market now, so he'll have... What, three and a half weeks, four weeks of full training before he can debut. So that's going to be really good. Hopefully he can hit the ground running. Mikel Dessler, like I've heard good things about him. They have kind of a glut now, at, like with John Gallagher can play on either side. Uh, Guillermo uh, Biro has been a good signing at left back. There's a lot to like here. And Savatok, again, Ukraine international. He's with Ukraine at the Euros right now. These are three, what they hope to be starting level players. And again, one of which absolutely a star in Usman Bukhari. That's the idea. That's the goal. So right now, I don't even know what else that they need because this feels these would have been the things that I said, particularly DP attacker and center back. Um, maybe another winger to kind of add behind because Bukhari and Halder O'Brien have similar profiles in just that there's vertical frets, hopefully goal scorer. Again, I think Bukhari is, is more creative and chance creation than Halder O'Brien, but having another winger with a different profile, I think either more creative or more of a goal scorer or whatever it is, that's probably where I'd go. They're a little light in the midfield, but but who knows if they really need to add any more or, or what the what the priorities would be there. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. So again, this all comes down to, and I'm probably going to use this a lot for other teams. It's about long term solutions, particularly with Austin. They started this last summer. Diego Fagundes out, Matt Hedge is out, and then what they've done over the winter, and then again trying to be methodical about. You know, Diego Rubio, we think he's a good fit for this team. Add him in, right? Like, uh, Bureau, left back, we think he's a good fit. We'll add him in. So, that's what I think Austin are going to do. So, I'm not sure if they're going to add a ton more players. Maybe it'll depend on, on more outgoings. Again, obviously, Emmanuel Rigoni. They've already, they, they can add another DP, or if they go with two DPs, 40 20 initiatives, then they can, they'd have flexibility there. So, I think we'll see what happens on the outgoings. But for now, for me, like, I really like how quickly that they've worked this ahead of the summer. And again, I would have said DP attacker and center back as the absolutely two glaring needs that that needed to be fixed. They've already brought them in as well as Mikel Dessler in the right back. So they're off to a good start. Let's see how these players fit. Charlotte FC, like I was talking about with Atlanta, this is another one of the very most interesting teams to watch for me this summer. They can add two DPs and at least a, a U22 initiative. So what I've got here is what I would do. Top priority would be DP number 10. Second would be DP number nine. Um, and then the U22 edition winger. They're working on that deal for Tim Ream. I haven't asked in, in a week, but last time I asked, they, I was told that it wasn't quite done. Um, we'll see if that's there. You know, that seems like something that just makes sense for everybody to get done. So Tim Ream, Detroit FC, I think that would help a lot. Help kind of transition when whenever you think that they're going to sell Adilson Milanda. Melanda. It give, you know, it's probably hard done on for Andrew Privet that he's probably not going to be the 
first choice starter if Tim Ream's here because again Tim Ream is really good right um but you know look every team needs kind of a glut of center back today hey, maybe they they flip Bill Tuiloma and get some more assets or, or you look at like the glut there and teams need left uh, need center backs just look at FC Cincinnati and others so that's straightforward as for the DPs what I've been told is that they're prioritizing a DP number nine I would be prioritizing a DP 10 um, though I know that they need both, and in, in the perfect world they need both, but I think that a 10 is more important than a 9 at this point because they don't, like, again, Leal Abada on the wing, I think he's a, he's a, absolutely a difference maker. It's been a very good signing, I think, and I think it's only going to get better with better players around him. They don't have, like, a pure 10 chance creator, and you look at these Dean Smith systems, they could have, like, if they get the right signing, and, like, this is why they're targeting Marco Royce for this spot, um, if they get the right signing there, like, that player can absolutely cook. That player can absolutely like have the structure around him to excel and really succeed. Like you look at, if you could just drop in some of the, the best number 10s in MLS. And like, again, it's cherry picking the obvious, like just the best case scenarios, but like Ricky Pooch, Lucho Acosta, Carlos Sill. Carlos Sill does more work off the ball than those two, but you got my point, right? Even, like Thiago Mata is somebody who doesn't do a ton of work against the ball. And like, that's fine. As long as you structure the team around him. This team is perfectly structured for a DP 10 to just come in and be the orchestrator of, of this attack. So, I think that they're going to go with the DP9 first, or, or that's the top priority. From what I've heard for, for people like outside of the team or people with knowledge of, of what the team's thinkings are. So we'll see how that goes. But again, like that's going to be very important too. Patrick Ajimang, we all love him. They need another center forward. Like he's the only, I think, natural center forward. There's Yuri Tavares. But like, again, Patrick Ajimang, the only real natural center forward in this team right now. They have a lot of money and they've been very ambitious. I know that you don't get any points for almost signing players. You don't, you don't get to raise a banner. You don't have to have a press conference. But look, Albert Groenbeek was more than $10 million of what they were trying to spend to sign the number 10. They've, they've tried for Marco Royce. You know, Luciano Rodriguez, the Uruguayan wonder kid. They really, they really gave, it, gave it a go in, in the spring, right? That would have been opportunistic. They go out and sign Liel Abada. That was a super opportunistic signing. Well done. So I have, I have high hopes for where they go from here. Again, bringing in Tim Ream, that's going to put them in the zeitgeist even more for American fans and national team. So... I'm very, very excited to see what Charlotte does this summer. And whatever they do, it's not going to be for a lack of ambition or a lack of finances. Next up, Chicago Fire. Um, this one's interesting as well for me because it's it's a lot of top-end stuff is what they really need. Again, and like they need a DP attacker. So sort the Jaredon Shakiri exit. I, I almost I forgot to write it down here, but that's, that's kind of the first. They can still add a DP no matter what. So you can kind of do that as a dual track. You can, like first and foremost, they need... A DP attacker. And for me, I would go with the chance creator more than, say, like a second forward. Again, like to cherry pick the best examples, Cucho Hernandez in this team would be pretty awesome, right? Everybody could say that. But the type of like combo forward who can, who could be a goal scorer, but also can kind of pull some strings or like, like more so than, I guess, using the club screw, Lucas Elrayon. Again, he's an awesome player, but I think that they need more chance creation than they do uh, goal scoring, right? But Either way, I think they'd be fine. But but Hugo Kuypers, I think, is should be is their proper number nine. He needs somebody that could be like a secondary scorer, but I think more than anything else, a primary chance creator. So again, Jaron Shakiri, he's at the Euros. He's already said he wants to leave. They can add one DP, and if Shakiri leaves, they can add two. If they can add two, you could really talk me into a killer DP number six for this team. Like imagine if they signed an Obi Nwoboto or a prime Jao Paulo. Like those were two D mids that came in on DP deals. Absolutely excellent. So. For me, I'm always in for a DP6 in the right circumstances. And I think this would absolutely be one of them because your air quote third attacker can be Brian Gutierrez. And he's very, very good. They have other options. Hale Slossi. Um That's, you know, I was going to start saying Kutsias and, and, and Mueller. Yeah, they're technically options, but they haven't, they haven't been so good. So I'm going to pump the brakes on that. But anyway, like I think that the attack would have enough if you add another DP and you get that right to add a DP number six because you put him next to Kellen Acosta and that immediately becomes a strength of this team. It makes the it the jobs of your back line easier. It makes your center backs better because that they have that cover in front of them. And for me, like a DP six is a force multiplier. Again, if you get it right, it makes everybody around them better because it makes their job much, much easier. It can go wrong. Carlos Guerrezo in San Jose did go wrong. I was in favor of that signing. So just, just so that I don't uh, only cherry pick the best options for all of these teams and the best examples. So that's one way it could go perilous. But for me, if you get it right as a DP six, I think it's good. And then with that, uh, Tehran still could go to Europe this summer. Um, they needed a center back upgrade regardless, and they would have much more flexibility if it is Tehran that leaves. 
But again, like I'm not sure exactly where the cap sheet is, and I prioritize a DP six than like being like, oh crap, like we need to bring in a center back. All we can really do is a DP spot in terms of the salary cap. Like I'd still say go with a six and and then work it from there. FC Cincinnati, low key, super interesting team. Uh, you know, I only say low key because a month ago wasn't super low key, right? I mean, it, it wasn't really super obvious. Now, um, what they need here, and this is, I need to. What what that says that I'm covered up by my by my face. I should have uh, gotten the uh, the measurements correct here. A living, breathing, healthy center back. That's first and foremost. Matt Miazga is going to be out a long time. Miles Robinson is currently at the Copa America with the national team, and then injuries to Nick Agua and Kip Keller. Right, like they're at bare bones right now. I think you call Austin after they signed Savatak. I think you call Charlotte after they signed Tim Ream. I think you call New England because everyone knows that uh, Dave Romney was available. Now he's starting, so maybe it's not Romney, but maybe it's somebody else. If, hell, Jonathan Mensa. Why not, right? Like just somebody who, who can eat up games right now and stabilize you until you get your starters and stars back. That's the obvious one, and that's the less exciting one because move out Aaron Bupenza, which is absolutely the plan, and bring in a big DP. I would be clamoring here for a DP center forward. I still think that's the right move, but... We got to address those reports on Weston McKinney. Like, those are real. They're really trying. And you could talk me into how it could fit on the field, right? You could talk me into Lucho goes even further forward and, and McKinney unlocks the side of his game of, of chance creation or, or adding more goals or, or whatever. And you say, hey, Kevin Kelsey, we really believe that we're going to keep him on a U22 initiative deal. And then we could add another U22 initiative forward, whatever it is. I get it. Look, if even if it doesn't make exact sense, Weston McKinney, if you have a chance to bring him in, and you're comfortable with the finances and you believe in it, then you go for it, right? Like, I'm not going to blame them there, even if it's not the exact perfect fit for this roster, but that's fine, right? Like, so whatever the DP is, if it's not McKinney, then I think you really got to go with the center forward, but who knows? We'll see how that all evolves. A lot to watch there in FC Cincinnati land. Columbus Crew, Aiden Morris replacement. Nothing, nothing has got official there yet, but in the next few days, that should be done. Again, Aiden Morris has played his last game with the club. They've already brought in Dylan Chambos. Um, again, he's more of an attacker than he is an eight, uh, but he can play as an eight. And, and versatility is something that Wilfred Nancy likes. So Aiden Morris replacement. A new Patrick Schulte deal I think should be at top of the list. Um, and then if you could tell Cucho Hernandez is agent to turn his phone off and don't don't listen to any offers, I think that'd be great. And above it all, they still have an open DP spot. So let's go back to the top. The Aiden Morris replacement. We'll see. Could, like They've shown adept. Like Again, they, they've already brought in AZ Jackson as well. That was an in-league move. Like They have players that they like within the league that they could move on. So we'll see where it goes. Look, there's going to be center mids available as well. Portland, and we're going to get to them later. I think Portland have a glut, like whether that's Eric Williamson, who I think would be really awesome for this team. Um, they might not have a ton of defensive bite in that midfield, but if it's him and Nagby, but if it's him and Nagby, you're never getting the ball off of them. Like I can't imagine what their possession numbers would be like. Um, or Christian Paredes, like at, also at, at uh, the Portland Timbers. Like that might be a team that you call with uh, looking for a, cent- a first central midfielder. Or maybe use a DP spot on an eight. Look, man, like Wilfred Nance, if Wilfred Nance in this front office says, like, yeah, I think we think that's the best idea, then like, who the hell am I to tell them no? Like, they've everything they've done has been the correct decision. So I'm very, very excited to see what they do with that. And hey, by the way, they've got Derek Jones, they've got uh, Sean Zawatsky, they've got other players that can play in that position. So we'll see. Patrick Schulte, uh, there's interest in the Premier League from him, but like, if you can keep him, you keep him. Like, let him develop here. Like, if he would go to one of those teams in, in England, it's not like, like, it'd be a Gaga Sonina situation. He he would just be loaned. And, like, that's cool, too. Like, if that deal is present, that's awesome. But if Patrick Schulte wants to resign and continue developing here before eventually going to Europe to somewhere where he could be a first-team starter rather than go somewhere and get loaned, I think you have to do that. And from my understanding, he's very open to that, and that's something that I think should be on the table. Cujo Hernandez, please don't leave, just selfishly for me. Um, what I'm told, like... The crew aren't dumb. They understand that this is always going to kind of be in the back of your head. And hey, if like a huge offer comes in and it's the right, uh, the right situation for Cujo, it's kind of going to have to happen. Like part of Tim Beswichenko's pitch to Cujo was that, yeah, you can, you can still go back to Europe. You're going to come here, play some great soccer. We're going to be competitive. We're going to put this team around. You're going to be the face of the team. And oh yeah, you can still go back to Europe at some point if, if when the, if the option's right. So that's all to watch out for. I'm sure that they have center forward targets just in case. Again, I really hope it doesn't happen, but just in case. So those are, are kind of top of the mind for Columbus Crew. Colorado Rapids. They just need to finish the Hafa Navarro deal. Um, I have every every expectation that's going to get done, but he is going to be a DP because it's a good problem to have. 
he's just scoring too many goals, and there's too much interest in Brazil to do anything but make him a DP. But they're going to get some some money knocked off that original four and a half million purchase option price, which for the Colorado Raptors can be very useful in what else they do. What else they need to do is maybe replace Moise Bombito. Again, they their top preference is that they keep him for another 12 to 18 months. But with Leon coming in with an offer, already rejected around $4 million, they're going to come back in with another one. There are a bunch of other teams interested. And guess what? His stock's only going to go up with good performances at the Copa America. So, man, if I had to guess, those offers are going to grow to a point that's acceptable. But they've got to be ready. There's no way to replace a super draft pick's value to this team, him being one of the best center backs in the league. So that's really, really tough. But you'll get the allocation money. You'll get the spending money to go try to bring in another center back. And we'll see what happens. But again... Bambito has to be sold first if that's going to happen. And, and hey, maybe they're still going to hold out hope that they can sign him to a new contract. Outside of that, with Lamine Diak leaving after a failed loan, going to want to bring in another defensive midfielder. I don't know if they're going to go in league or out of league. In league would make the most sense because they want to go for it. Like, I love that this club recognizes, hey, like, you're not always going to be one of the better teams in the Western Conference. And, and this isn't just a Colorado thing. This is an all-teams thing. Like, I love that that from what I know is that they're like, okay, we're really good. And we don't we're not gonna assume that it's gonna be like this every year. And like the Western Conference is pretty wide open, honestly. Um again, RSL, LAFC, LA Galaxy are all very good too. But the Rapids, like why can't they beat LAFC, right? Like why can't they they be one of the best teams in the West? So they wanna do everything they can to make sure that they're in the best position to compete this year. The best position to compete this year might be trying to find an intra league defensive midfielder. Obviously, that's not easy. It's, it would cost money. Um, but, like, again, whether that or center back as well, too. Like, who knows exactly where they'll go. But um, what I can tell you for certain is that this team knows they have a chance to compete and they want to compete. DC United. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a tough six weeks, probably, whatever it's been. Um, and, look, like, they were overperforming before. Now they're underperforming. And, and, like, that's where it is. DC United, this was always supposed to be a transition year. So they shouldn't be kicking themselves too much. And I know for a fact that they will keep this mindset, but what I would be telling them if they were listening to me, and why would they listen to me? But long-term building blocks stick to the vision, right? My understanding is, that, again, what I know is that the cap sheet was really, really bad what they inherited. What they did all winter was just trying to dig out bad contracts, um, reset the health. You know, there was allocation money pulled forward in recent years as, as people were worried about losing their jobs, which they ended up doing. Um, so... Everything was like a short-term, try to band-aid this, band-aid that. And that comes at a long-term cost. DC United have understood that. And from what I think and what I understand is that they don't really have any room to do anything significant this summer for that reason. And they're trying to maintain this long-term vision, stick to the vision. If they can get, like, if more players will leave, that would help dictate what comes in. But for me, you'll really see what this team can do and, and what they want to do in the transfer market in the winter. And to be able to do that, they have to be responsible in the summer. So I think that if they can be opportunistic, they will be. But I wouldn't expect a whole lot from DC United this summer. FC Dallas, first and foremost, um, coaching search. Peter Lucin, like, they're fun. At least they're scoring goals. Like, they're conceding goals as well. So maybe this is why Nico Estevez wasn't opening it up um, while he was in charge before he got fired. But I like watching them again, and, and that's what I appreciate. Desperately need a center back or, or two, honestly. And they should have some flexibility with putting Pax and Pomegal on the season-ending injured list. That's what the SEI is there. And that's that's where the funding will come from there. So they could hopefully sign like a like a real significant center back rather than just trying to find a veteran minimum type of guy, right? Like So I think that they could have the room to, to really take a swing. But again, I don't know that for certain. I think so, but I don't know for certain. The other thing, which isn't something that they need to do in the transfer market, what they need to do with the coaching staff. Optimize this attra- attacking trio of Peter Musa, Jesus Freira, and when Alan Velasco gets back, Alan Velasco. I keep saying it. I know I'm going to fall in, like, just fall for this again. These three players make so much sense together, and that is the foundation of not just a really good attack. It's the foundation of a great attack, those three players. They're so complementary to each other. They're all very good in their own rights, uh, again, provided how quickly Alan Velasco can get back to speed. I do hope that, that that's what happens rather than selling Alan Velasco to Boca Juniors, but again... I understand, right? Like, I, 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 like, if a bid, big bid comes, like that's just the nature of the business. So I hope that they those three stay. So you're not looking again for the search. But that's where I'm at with FC Dallas. And I will say again, even with the loss to Seattle, like it's it's been it's been positive. Houston Dynamo, first and foremost, they already signed Ezekiel Ponce, DP, club record signing center forward. 
And right after they announce that, Sebas Ferreira comes in and has scores a hat trick. So it, it, it's funny, man. These sliding doors. What if Sebas Ferreira didn't get hurt early in the season? What if he was playing like this? Like again, it's a one game sample against DC United, who are one of the kind of the worst teams defensively in terms of expected goals against and chances given up. All that I understand. Three goals to three goals. They desperately needed that all season. And again, sliding doors. What if Sebas was playing like this consistently at the beginning of the year without getting hurt? Who knows? But Ezekiel Ponce is here. That doesn't, like, the, the hat trick for Sebas certainly doesn't hurt in trying to sell him. And unless something's changed in the last 48 hours, I still think that they're very much planning to sell Sebas Frere. So then they'll have another DP spot open. I would use it on another attacker. Either a goal-scoring winger or a number 10 for their box midfield. Right now, obviously, they have Amin Bossi and Coco Karaskia as the two kind of tips of that box. Um, but Coco could leave in the summer, right? Or maybe you just upgrade. And maybe you just say, screw it. Everybody, like, it's a good problem to have more competition. But we'll see where that one goes. Again, you could really talk him into it like a goal-scoring winger as well. And then I think that they're going to use a U22 initiative slot on a young forward. Again, whether it's center forward, but I think it'll be a winger. But again, who knows? This is... This is a fun story. It's a fun team when they're at their best. I really hope Ponce hits the ground running. Again, like the game model, Hector Herrera playing the way he's playing, Coco Casquilla, watch him for as long as you can. Like there's a lot to like about this team. And if Ponce hits the ground running, or hey, if Sebas Ferreira is, keeps scoring goals, we'll see what happens. LAFC. I mean, for me, it's star hunting. And I know Griezmann is like, why not, right? <laughs> like I get it. Like it's not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen this summer at least. Um, but like that should always be on their mind. And this is a team that has the ability to sign Griezmann, both in terms of their market and the star power of being able to bring out uh, players to Los Angeles and also the money to, to put up, I think it's a $15 million release clause. Somebody like that or Dybala and the romantic in me, man, I would love if Carlos Vela came back. Um, I hope he doesn't retire, but we'll see, man. It's sad to, it's sad to see him kind of just float off and good for him, man. He's, he's earned it all, but I'd love to see uh, Carlos Vela back in the LAFC shirt. After that, finalized the Mamadou fall deal to Barcelona. Haven't gotten any updates on that. I know that they were in advanced talks with Barcelona. That loan expires in a week or whatever. And we'll see if that one totally gets done. And with that, maybe you have some allocation money to bring in some more depth. And particularly, I think, the midfield more so than central defense just because of the names that they already have in defense. Um, so I'd probably prioritize the midfield. But again, like even with the with the open the ability to add a DP or another U22 initiative, like... It, I would love to see them bring in, like I said, a, a, a Griezmann or bring back a Vela, but like Kiki Oliveira is playing well. Like Giroud's already come in the summer, obviously, right? Like they have young, young attackers like uh, David Martinez, who I really, really highly rate. I think that, you know, we'll get to see like he dealt with injuries and everything. And I, and I don't exactly know off the top of my head um, where everything stands at. But again, like the, the idea is that they have young players that they believe in in, in the near and, and long term future. So we'll see how that all goes. LA Galaxy, this is pretty straightforward for a team that did their big work in the winter and they're paying dividends for how quickly they've started in 2024. So first of all, keep working on Marco Royce. My last update was they're still working on it. Obviously, a deal is not done, but nothing has been decided in a negative way, which is good. Uh, but they're still trying. They're still working. After that, a new Jalen Neal contract. His deal is going to be up in 18 months, I believe. Um, and he's an important player for this team. He's it, It'd be cool to keep watching him grow and develop and then sell him on one day. And again, he's he's the youth in this in this uh, older kind of central back depth chart. So it's a bit boring for the Galaxy, but that's good. You know, th at this time last year, they were uh, really kind of spinning out of control with some injuries and some bad DPs and looking forward. Oh, in the winter, we'll have much more much more flexibility, all of this. Oh, maybe we can get you Lozano or whatever, all this stuff. Like everything was future and everything was, oh, we'll fix it, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. They did fix it. Joseph Panzo, Gabriel Peck ha have been great. Ricky Pooch, new long-term contract. Don't have to worry about that right now. Dejan Jovlic is a player reborn under this system. Guess what? When you put players that, that fit with each other, everybody gets better. And it's been awesome to watch. Like, again, for me, you could like you could talk about maybe an, another central midfielder. But again, with Delgado, Brugman, Cerillo, that's three starting caliber players for me. Again, the, the, the center back depth chart is what it is. Like, it's not perfect, but I don't think it's bad, honestly. Like, I really like the idea of Yoshida and Jalen Neal getting an extended run. Julian Ade has been really, really good. So, they've got a lot. They've already, they've got attacking depth with Diego Fagundes, like, being technically the odd man out of their strongest 11. Then they could add Royce to that. Like, they could have an embarrassment of riches up top. I don't know how this is all going to play out, but, man, I'm excited, like, they don't have a ton to do, and while it's boring for this video here, it's it's absolutely good news for the LA Galaxy. 
Inter Miami, um, center back, and it's going to be tough to fit under the cap and find them. Like again, like they they've suffered a lot of injuries there. It's been great to see Ian Frey back. He's going to help a lot. They just need to survive in advance in the summer, and they've done so far without Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez. It's been very impressive. If I was advising them, go the route of two DPS and four U twenty two initial players and the two million game. That is the best for what this team needs squad building. But they're probably not going to. I'm going to go out and pretty con- uh, concretely say they're not going to because this is the team of Lionel Messi. This is a team of stars. They're going to they're going to want to sign Anel Di Maria or they're going to want to sign Griezmann or whoever, right? And that's also good too. But in squad building, if you have Suarez and Busquets as your two DPs and then you could bring in a fourth U22 initiative player and the allocation money, I think that would go further. But hey, man, I'm not going to say no to stars. That's going to make them even more interesting. Speaking of stars, what about young stars? Keep them through the end of the season. There is interest in Diego Gomez. I'm reporting that Brighton Hove Albion have made an offer. Another club have made an offer. I don't know what that club is yet. They need to keep Diego Gomez through the season. What they need to do is agree a deal now so he stays, and then he leaves in the winter. I hope that that's going to be the, the, the idea, but it depends on what Brighton or this other club or whoever ends up agreeing a deal, if whatever they see from. It's their money. You could really push. You can really try, but if the other team is just like, this deal is available right now or not at all, what, is, what are you going to do and what is the player going to want? Right? Like, so... In a perfect world, keep Diego Gomez for the rest of the season. Uh, he's already going to be gone at the Olympics in August, so maybe that helps in your negotiations. Like, hey, like he's, you know, he really wants to go to the Olympics anyway, so if you sign him, you're going to want to keep him, right? Like, whatever. So, I don't know. I hope to see it like that. Then that would pretty conveniently solve their U-20 initiative spot because if they only do three, they have the fourth, Faguna Farias, who's out with a season-ending injured. So he just comes and takes up the U-22 initiative spot next year. So that'd be good, but we'll see where that one goes. Minnesota United, use that DP spot. I think a chance creator is what I would say to put next to Robin Ludd to take some of the pressure off him. But also, you could really talk me into an absolutely killer number six, like Nwoboto or like Zhao Paulo. Like, I think that this would work a lot for this team. What I think is that it would be a Nwoboto type or like maybe even a younger profile because what they want to do is be energetic. They want to be youthful. They want to be development focused. They want all of this. That's nothing new. We've talked about this. So I think that that's going to inform every decision they make. And just if you're listening and hoping to try to figure out who it might be, that's probably where they're going to go. But hey, who knows? Another one, any takers for Timu Puki? Um, again, I don't, I don't think he's, he's a problem in any way. But hey, maybe there's a solution that makes sense for both sides in terms of him leaving and going somewhere that he's kind of valued more and them getting out of the DP spot in that contract. I don't know. Just throwing it out there because... There's not a ton obvious. Like, they're going to need to replace Kervin Arriaga. I'm going to miss him. I think he's a very good player. And they just sold their center back. Um, I'm already blank on it. Back to Sweden. Anyway, so they might need another center back. Um, one name that I would like, again, we're going to get to San Jose later. Jackson Yule? Again, I already brought up the Portland center mid situation, and I'm sure that there's much many others off the top of my head. Like, why not be able to, to try to get into those games? Like spend some allocation money or whatever, right? Like, I don't know what their cap sheet looks like, but hey, those, those are ones that make sense. And then, again, I'm really clutching at straws here, but a new contract for Tani Alawusi? Yeah, I think that'd be very good. I think that'd be very interesting. Um, I think what his, like, his production, I don't think that he's going to be, you know, the golden boot winner in MLS. But I think this is real. I don't think that this is just a career season and that he'll never touch these heights again. A lot of this is repeatable. Matt Doyle has obviously done some great work in, in like unearthing the numbers. Like you go back every year, a lot of the finishes he has, like the, everything matches up. It's not like he's getting lucky with long, like long range or just bad, like lucky tappings. Like the tappings he gets are smart center forward movements. So I'm kind of all in on Tani Alawusi. So like, and, and again, maybe if Pookie leaves, you do grab a, a DP number nine as well, or you try to. Uh, but for me, I would like to see Tani Alawusi continue to get minutes. Ah. Oh, my goodness, Montreal. So, in a perfect world, I would just say, add some DPs, right? Spend some money, care about this team. But, like, like, I don't don't really want to spend time stressing over, you know, the way we wish the world was rather than what it is. Do you really think that they're going to go spend 10 million and 8 million on two DPs? What do you think? They don't have, they don't even have a sporting CEO right now. It's, it's, uh, it's Gervais, and, and he's, I think he was just their business CEO. Now he's interim CEO because, uh, Olivier Renard left. Uh, Vasily left for San Jose. It's just less meddling, man. Ah, like this team has a lot of potential. I feel bad for the fans. Um, it's just disappointing. It's difficult to talk about because, again, you'd say add a add another DP attacker or like hell, go try to add a, a 
even a DP center back at this point. I would take it, right? But I just don't think that's going to happen. So within the constraints of what they have, they obviously need defensive help. They've been awful defensively this year. Um, I don't know if they're if they're pushing on Laurent Quetzal to, to change his game on or anything. I don't think that he should or, or he will. I think they just need some better players, and I don't know if it's going to come. So my tone changed on this one. It's a little disappointing. I don't really have a great read on this. I don't know exactly what to say because there's just so much turmoil around this club on the like sporting and executive sides rather than within the locker room. So who knows? There's still a lot to, there's still a lot you can talk yourself into with this team, but I don't know if we're going to see it. New England Revolution. Giacomo Veroni has been good over the last month, like legitimately good as they've won four games in a row. Does that earn him a stay through the rest of the season or will they still look for a new DP forward? I think that's the, the chief question with this team. It's like, ah, like six weeks ago, 100%. Do whatever you got to do to to open that DP spot and bring in a new forward. But right now, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, this team is back in the playoff race. Um, Caleb Porter, credit to him for, for what he's done and, and he's given... You know his press conference is saying we've stuck to the plan. All of this that that's been that's been good. He's deserved this this kind of victory lap or whatever it is because they have four wins in a row and it's a results business. We'll see what happens over the next four weeks. Uh, but for me, on top of that, that's the biggest question of what you want to do with Veroni and the DB spot, if anything at all. The second one for me is get assets for one year center backs. I think that they have a glut of center backs, and there are a lot of teams like Cincinnati who could use a center back in MLS, like. Again, whether it's, you know, again, Dave Romney has been starting now, so maybe it's not him. Like, he was kind of the odd man out before. So maybe now it's Jonathan Mensah. Like, what what can you, like, can you free up some stuff? Can can you get a little bit of assets, right? Like, I guess you look down the list, like Henry Kessler. Like, I don't think that New England would want to lose him, and, and I don't know what exactly the market would be. But, like, I think these are the conversations you have to have when, when you kind of have a glut at center back, which is a good problem to have after bringing in Javier Young. Next up, Nashville SC. First and foremost, finish the BJ Callahan deal. Get your head coach in and get that done. After that, what they really, really need in this group is a line-breaking center mid. Somebody who can get the ball into Honey Mukhtar's feet in good positions and let him kind of orchestrate the game. Now, like in a different game model, he needs to be much more of a combo attacker than than a pure goal scorer. He's still, it's not like he was bad at creating chances in the past, but like his duty in that game model was like, go on and get goals, go on and be special, kill people in transition, all that, right? Like, so he needs to do like even more kind of in terms of build up and, and getting the ball into the final third and playing a killer pass while hopefully Sam Surge will keep scoring goals and you can get some more goals from the winger. So what this team most needs in, in the transfer market is a line breaking central midfielder, somebody who can pass the ball forward, a different profile to what they currently have. They're looking for the U22 initiative to use that uh, to, f- that slot. And I think under BJ Callahan, they can really go after young players again or, or look at different markets than, that weren't working under Gary Smith. Like, Gary Smith didn't play much youth. And again, like, that is a criticism, and he should be criticized for it, but he was also winning games. So it's not too much, right? It's just different styles. But hopefully this opens up. Like, they can get maybe try South American players more again, right? Like, I think Randall Leal and, and Anibal Godoy were their two most used South American players or Central American players, sorry, um, under Gary Smith in this previous regime. Like maybe this opens up different profiles and different resumes under a new coach. Again, these are just thoughts and, and possibilities. We'll see exactly what happens. I Again, I think that it opens up the scouting department further, more age profiles, more, just more of different profiles. So we'll see what happens, but hey, I'm excited to see what they do. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of talk on Nashville there. My bad. NYCFC, Talos Magno departure. That is first and foremost. He's talked about it. It's time for him to leave, right? Like, he's not playing. doesn't make sense for any, anybody for him to still be here. Um, I wonder if he's going to go back to Brazil or Europe. Bologna had a loan offer rejected from last year with a big purchase option because NYCFC were like, we don't really want to do a loan. Like, we want to do, like, if you want to buy him, like, we're open to talking. This is our price. If you meet it, you meet it. The purchase option met their price, but it was like, we, again, we, we, we don't really want to do a loan. So that's where it was. And then with that open spot, either you use a DP spot or now with the two DPs, 40, 20 initiatives, I think that they would, they would probably do that just based on CFG's philosophy. You had a high leverage, another high leverage attacker, probably like, that's what I would do. Even though like, they've got a lot of talent in the attack, maybe a center forward, like me out of like, they don't want to block me out of it. your back row, but this is a team that's really good. How do you straddle? We, we want to keep developing these players and giving them chances. And also, hey, if we got a killer number nine, like, we'd be really, really good. And we're already really good, right? Like, so it, it's, it's difficult. I don't envy the situation David Lee and that front office is in. But that's kind of where I'm at for their future. And and after that, or alongside that, uh, Christian McFarland, I've reported that 
Uh, the deal to Manchester City was closed a while ago. Haven't gotten any updates on that. Decide, you know, finish that and, and probably deal for the winter so he stays here the rest of the year. Then you, you, you can work on getting another backup left back for now and letting him kind of develop and, and play some games before he goes. New York Red Bulls, go for it. DP number nine, please. That's uh, that's the plan from what I understood. And hopefully that they can execute that plan. We'll see, right? So you've got Emil Forsberg in his at the end of his prime at 32. You've got Lewis Morgan playing at the top of his game. Dante Van Zier is chipping in again. He, he's not a difference maker as a DP at this moment, but it's still a good attack. Elias Manuel has been scoring goals. The defense, all this, like everything is there. You have a DP spot. Go use it. I know that's the plan. I hope that they do. And I think it'd be best suited up top. And then you have Lewis Morgan and uh, Neil Forsberg as those two attacking midfielders. And then behind them, starting level defensive midfielder to replace Frankie Amaya. I do know that is also the plan. They, as part of the deal to sell Amaya, like they were assuring, like, okay, this is going to be top of the list as well for the summer that we need to come away with, like, rather than, like, again, they do trust Peter Stroud when he comes back. They do trust their young players. But I think that they recognize this, this can be a win now moment. And I don't think they're going to let it pass. And again, maybe I'm going to look really dumb in six weeks and, and this wouldn't have happened, but that that's kind of what I've heard. And that's what I'm going to go with. And then again, like if we're nitpicking, maybe you could use some depth, maybe another depth defensive midfielder, maybe another depth left back. But like, I don't like, that's not important. What's important is a DP nine and a starting level defensive midfielder. So New York Red Bulls like NYCFC are very good and they have the chance this summer to be really, really good and really be among some of those uh, trof- top, top, not trophy contender. So let's see what happens. Yeah, Orlando City. So off the top, I was talking about what do you do with the summer transfer window if you're one of those teams that are near the bottom or have been disappointing. Orlando's one of the ones at top of mind. Like, I think they have to uh, hope for internal improvement and not pull forward assets from the future chasing what might be a lost cause. And I'm not saying it's a lost cause. I'm just saying they need to be wise to see where they are in even like it changes every every couple of weeks like it's like MLB season where a team could have two bad weeks in June or early July and all or yeah early June whatever and all of a sudden they go from hey we're gonna we're gonna be buyers at the trade deadline and hey maybe now we're sellers so that's what's different like, soccer is super different obviously but salary cap league like we'll see what happens like they've used a lot of their assets and this team again is very good on paper it's just they haven't been so much this season and alongside that Duncan McGuire's future. I keep saying the same thing. They don't want to sell him. That's their stance. The player is definitely very open to a move. He's their leading scorer. Um, again, he already would have been gone to Blackburn, if not for a bad administrator and an administrative error. So I'm not sure what to make of that. There's plenty of interest. Like I said, England, Italy, we'll see. I haven't heard anything about new fresh offers, but again, I think that they're going to keep coming. And with him going to the Olympics, like there's a lot. There's There's a lot. There could be a lot here. I don't know. Uh, so that's another fluid situation because then maybe that gives you assets to do something if you want to beyond that. But I think I, I think I know Orlando City, their optimal uh, outcome is Duncan McGuire still being on the team. Philadelphia Union. Oh, my God. It's been uh, it's been a dumpster fire lately. Um, this one. This one's easy. It starts with a DP number nine and with the Philadelphia Union. Don't know what their budget's going to be. But again, it's not going to be what FC Cincinnati's trying to get for <laughs> Weston McKinney or it's not going to be what some of these other teams are doing, right? But that's just the reality of the situation. They got Julian Carranza in. They got Mikel Uhr in before. They got Daniel Gazdag in, probably a better example than Uhr, without a ton of money. So they just need to keep trying to do that again. So has to be a DP9. Maybe that they could add more to the attack and, and more kind of different options like what Kai Wagner was calling for. Um, and then this third bullet point I'm going to go to right now. Time machine to 2022. I don't know what the hell is going on with Elliot, Clevesness, Blake, and Martinez. That's been the spine of this team and, and they just haven't been good this year. I don't... I don't get it because they're all the same players. They're all in their primes, right? Like, it's just weird. So I don't have great analysis beyond, what the hell, guys? I don't know, right? Like, um, and then with Jack McGlynn, is this this summer or around the Olympics the time to move on? Particularly if the the union don't get out of this tailspin, I think it might be time, right? Like, I know that the player has played a ton of games. The team believe that he can keep developing here, and I'm sure he could. It's easier to say that if you're in third place than if you're in 10th. So... I think that's going to be dependent on if they can right the ship with this team in this window. Portland Timbers, uh, defensive help. Um, I think the defensive help is going to come by way of defense-minded midfielders. Um, So for me, they have a DP spot open. And earlier this year, the idea was probably use it on a winger. But this attack has been so, so good. But again, between Evander, uh, Jonathan Rodriguez, uh, Joseph Mora, and Santi Moreno, 
I don't think that you need to add a DP winger. I don't really think so. Like, because they've been incredible. And I don't think it's fool's gold. I don't think it's a run of form. I guess you could worry a little bit about Joseph Mora and his ability to stay healthy. But Jonathan Rodriguez can play center forward. So I think that they have enough cover there. And maybe use a U22 initial slot instead. Or I don't, I don't know if they have one open. No, they don't have one open. I take that back. But regardless, my whole point is, what if you use the DP spot on a midfielder? I know that I've said this for a few other teams. I think it makes a lot of sense here. Like, they need a long-term solution for Diego Chara at some point. I really like Eric Williamson, but he's not playing that much. And he's a valuable player. Christian Paredes, like, I really like him too. Like, I think that you need to pick one of those two. And the other one, you trade. And and I've, I've thrown these names around for teams that need center mids. There are teams that need center mids. Go call the Colorado Rapids. Go call the uh, uh, Columbus Crew. Like, those are two valuable players in this league, and you could get decent returns for them. And it makes sense in a salary cap league to prioritize that. Then maybe you add more fullback depth. And hopefully this center mid, whether it's a DP spot or, or something else, hopefully that person immediately steps in and, and looks really, really good. Ayala is really coming around. And like he was starting to before he got hurt in the past. Uh, he's a player that I like a lot. I'm going to give a lot, a lot of chances to because I just think he's super talented. But yeah, the Portland Timbers, things, are, things have been going really well over the last month. Um, and it's interesting that it's without Crapo and Kamal Miller. And that, that doesn't, I think that's, you know, correlation versus causation. I do not think it's causation that these players are gone and they're playing better. But all to say, it's admirable that they're playing better without their two most important defensive players. And the leaps that Juan David Mascara is making off the ball, oof. Um, I was worried that they weren't going to be able to keep him this summer. Um, I think that they feel a little bit more confident in that. But I don't know, it's six or 12 months, man. This kid is so talented. And I think that he's going to be a Columbus national teamer in the future. So we'll see how that one goes. But I hope he stays a little bit longer. But at some point, they know they're going to need to sign a right back, too. Real Salt Lake. And this is another team, like I was saying with, with the Red Bulls. Go for it. Open DP spot. Uh, number 10, I see that that's covered. <laughs> number 10, question mark, is what I wrote. That's really it, man. This team is awesome. Just one more big addition. And they're going to be good. Like And like again, they're already really good. I understand not wanting to block Diego Luna or Fidel Barras or, or Carlos Gomez, whatever, right? Um, but I think right now, like, there are so many times when, when you can really, like, they're firmly in the conversation, are we the best team in the Western Conference? And when you have an open DP spot, I think that you need to do everything at your disposal. I guess the other side of that, too, is Diego Luna and Fidel Barras are two super highly rated young players, and, and Andres Gomez as well. Is there going to be offers for one of them? And then you really need to bring in a DP 10, right? Like, or a DP winger, or whatever it is. So I'm curious to see that. I hope all three players end up sticking around for the rest of the season. But hey, you never know. Um, it's been awesome to see Andres Gomez making the leap. He's so much fun. He's so, like, his athleticism jumps off the screen. Um, his ball strike ability is really good, too. That Those are two things that I loved about him, like, last year. And the consistency wasn't there yet because he was a young player. And the consistency has been there this year on top of the athleticism, on top of the ball striking, all that stuff. So... This is an awesome team. Really hope that they go for it this summer. We'll see how it goes. Seattle Sounders. Um, the top line here is, are they going to put the money forward to to push, to put Rui Diaz out to bring in a DP number nine? I think that's that's a question. And I think that comes down to more uh, discretionary funds than anything else because that comes with the investment from ownership to either buy out or trade or get rid of a kind of club legend. I don't want to be dismissive of what Roy Diaz is doing, but if this team wants to actually compete this year, they can. But I think it's going to require a DP9, and you can only do that if Rui Diaz leaves. Beyond that, Pedro De La Vega's health. That's that's what they need. This is uh, he, He's a profile that's different than everybody else in this team. That's the one thing that they knew that they needed after last season, and we've barely gotten to see it this year because he's been injured the whole time. Uh, they've been much better lately, so that's going to help him coming back into a team where instead of, you know, if he came back three or four weeks ago, it would have been like, save us, kid. Like, hey, we need you. Everything's going bad. So hopefully that'll be a little bit easier. And beyond that, looking at the trade market, same thing. Like, are there offers for new who? Or like, uh, are, are there offers for, you know, again, they traded Javier Arriaga, which I thought made sense. Like, is there any anywhere else on the field that that would make sense? I don't know. And whether, again, they could be active on the incoming side of the things. I'm not entirely sure. But Seattle Sounders, like, Low-key could climb if, if they have the right summer. I don't know if they will, but but we'll see. Um, Dear God, the San Jose Earthquakes. Um, yeah, long-term building blocks. That's it, man. Like, this is Jason Hernandez. Like, when Toronto FC fired Bob Bradley and, um, and then had an interim head coach, and Jason Hernandez took over as interim CSO. Hell, San Jose a few years ago, and Chris Leach took over when, you know, they bottomed out again. Um, 
Rodolfo Burrell coming to Austin FC last year. All it's about is getting the cap sheet healthier and identifying your long-term building blocks. This team unequivocally has two untouchables for me. That's Hernan Lopez and Christian Espinosa. Every decision they make from now until the opening day of next year has to be about who do we want to be, what do we want to put around these two players, and how can we go ahead and be great. In the right system, in the right style, these are two players that can that can lead a super fun competitive team. You can't give up 51 goals, of course. Do you believe that Danielle is going to be Danielle from 2023 or the guy that we saw at the beginning of 2024? Beginning of 2024, one of the worst goalkeepers in the league. I think that he's much more like the 2023 guy, but maybe now you're you're not as confident as banking on you know a top three, top five goalkeeper in the league like he was that year. So that's that. They need defensive up, upgrades, but like. I think it's more important that they gather assets for a winter overall. Me and Goss talking on soccer-wise. Goss put up a good point. Like, hey, I think Jackson Yule should be one of the building blocks. I kind of do, too, as a core player. But, like, if a big offer comes in, I think you do it. I think that you just rebuild right now. You try to kickstart things. You listen to offers. Benji Kikanovich, probably not going to get a big offer. But, like, it's something for assets. And it's something to keep moving the team on and evolving the team. There's... It's just disappointing. Again, 51 goals conceded. They think, like, I, I think that this has to be a long-term view rather than, like, hey, what if we win a couple games here and, and then maybe we can sneak into the playoffs? Like, I don't even think that's on the table. That can change very quickly in MLS, as it often does. But, and and then what? Finish ninth and lose in the play-in game? Like, I think that this team needs some some severe surgery, not, not a few uh, bandages. Another team that needs surgery, not bandages. Sporting Kansas City, they desperately need a defensive midfielder. Uh, just, just to kind of add to the group, like this central midfield depth has kind of been cut in by injuries. DP number 10, they've been dying for that all season. It, it's very, very obvious. Um, maybe ownership isn't putting up the money and I'd say probably not, but I don't know. I'm disappointed that they have not added a DP 10. Maybe they will early in the summer. Who knows? There's another team value long-term health and not short-term gains. They have a lot of issues. They, again, like I've been saying it, I'm worried about one injury to the center backs that would that would make things so again like a couple injuries in the midfield really toboggan their season, and that's what you have you have to look at it like you can't I don't think you can just sign one player like if you sign a DP10 it's a long term fit right, it's somebody who could be malleable whether Johnny Russell leaves or Polito or or whatever right like you look around the team like somebody who can be malleable rather than just like he fits perfectly into this Jenga slot I don't know. Another team that you know I just don't have a ton of juice on particularly after going back and forth San Jose disappointing that's Kansas City disappointing so that's not been a fun little uh little back-to-backs here St. Louis City not not so much fun either uh already signed Cedric Teutcher Jake Gerwood Reich those two have been announced Marshall Hartle hasn't been announced yet but by all indications that one's done I really like those three signings and I love how quickly that they've come in but still they find themselves losing and falling further and further away from the playoff line by the time these players get in they might be a little bit too far gone because, like, you're never really too far gone in MLS in mid-July. But effectively, you can be, right? I don't know. So, I'm very curious to see how the next few weeks play out. They could use another wide attacker, probably. Um, with AZ Jackson out and Celio Pompeo injured. And then they need to sort of Sam and exit. They held him out because of air quote transfer talks. And what I would say, it's a super red flag that I was assured that we don't know exactly if there's a deal there or not. So, you only hold out a player for a game if there's a deal that's about to be done. And it sounds like in this case, they didn't, which means that there's issues between Sam and Denner and the coaching staff is my best guess. So I think that they just need to get, get that done. Just move on. Both parties obviously need a clean break. He'd have some, a lot of interest, I'd imagine, around MLS right now. I don't know what value you can get for him because of his values at an all-time low and the fact that he's out of contract at the end of the year. So I don't know. I just think that you need to make it happen and rather than just looking for a big assets. So... Again, on one hand, I really like what St. Louis did just like ahead of the summer window. But on the other hand, is it too late? I hope not, but I don't know. Toronto FC. It's been a bad couple weeks, couple games. I don't know. Time's a flat circle. There's a billion games on all the time. Long-term building blocks. That is 1A. Again, I keep saying this. Like They overperformed early. Now they're underperforming again. Um, just value the long-term health of this club and continue with the long-term plan under John Herdman. Center backs and defensive midfielders, if there's room for additions, that's what I'd prioritize. Again, the team, the top end talent is good. You know, when Richie Larea, he hasn't really gotten a ton of run with this team uh, because of injury now and then at the Copa America, now with Canada. So when everybody's back in the summer or at the end of the summer, like, and, and more and more pieces are fit, this team could be like, they could be a frisky playoff team. And I think that's, that's the ceiling and that's what you try to be. And hey, man, things break your way. You have the, 
the talent of Insignia and Bernadeschi and, and you have some some other kind of special players, like you're always going to have a chance in the playoffs. So give yourself the best chance. But again, don't mortgage your future over the short-term window because I don't think it's a window. And I think that if Insignia and Bernadeschi are bought in like they are right now, this team could be really good next year if they're able to kind of continue overhauling the cap sheet and making the financial and, and the, the, the roster assets much healthier. So that's what I'd prioritize if I'm Toronto. Last but not least, the Vancouver Whitecaps. Um, I'm going to do this third bullet point first. I wish that they'd ha- do a high-level DP. I don't believe that they're going to. But I think the way that you really shake this up and really put this team up a tier is you get a, a sick attacker. Like, again, I, I've said this on previous shows. Ryan Gold, what I love about him is, is he fits around a lot of different profiles, and he's really, really good. Brian White, really good number nine. Um, but if they had one more special player in that attack... I think that this team, we'd be, we could be talking about them in that Real Salt Lake, LAFC, LA Galaxy tier. Colorado Rapids, Seattle Sounders, if, if things go right on both those sides. But again, like that's where the Vancouver Whitecaps are, and I really wish that that would, be, would happen, but I don't really have any trust that it's going to happen. Vandy Sartini told Andrew Wiebe of extra time that it wasn't that a DP wasn't going to come in. So what they can do around the edges is another midfielder um, and a wingback probably, right? Like So again, it, it, for me, like I don't think that that's going to really change the trajectory of this team. And that's that's fine. Like, who who gives a hell what I think? But again, like, I'm just gonna keep on harping back that like, I think that those are just gonna end up being sideways moves. They could be useful moves, but if this team really wanted to push to compete, it'd be a high level DP. All right, I've rambled long enough. Uh, that'll do it for me today. Uh, appreciate you all for sticking around. I don't know if you jumped team by team, but I hope that I had the same amount of juice for all these 29 teams. Hope that, uh, again, I had a lot of nuggets and a lot of thoughts in there. Again, most of what I said comes from intel that I'm gathering rather than just opinions. But you never always know which is which. Um, So, yeah, that's what we got today. We're going to have power rankings coming out soon once I reset my voice and I'm able to just yell at this and go go for 45, 55 minutes, however long this is. However many minutes, just just yelling uh, solo. Um, Again, subscribe to SoccerWise. Shout out Live Brew Football, the absolute legends. Um, And, yeah, stay tuned in for some news. And not just and not just player transfers. Yeah, I might have some more news for you.